Today we're starting uh, a new series looking at the book 1 Peter. And it's a book written by the guy in the name of the title, uh, Peter, uh, the, the apostle, disciple, follower of Jesus, also known as Simon Peter. And as we head into to diving into this letter, I think it's really important that we, that we take a moment to look at the story of Peter and what we see is a very relatable human faith. Sometimes when we read the letters, particularly those written by Paul, it feels like, I can't relate to this guy. He's like a superhero of the faith from beginning to end. He starts out as this, this chosen, up-and-coming next Jewish rabbi who is doing evil while he thinks he's doing good, has this meeting with Jesus, and then takes off in the other direction and accomplishes great things. And yet what we see in Peter is this transformative journey that really shapes and, and makes this a really personal letter that he's going to write that is both wordy and kind of in your face. And so Peter, Peter's story starts out uh, kind of right along the beginning of Jesus' story in the, in the Gospels. He's a common man of no standing. In fact, he's a fisherman. He's a Jewish man who's a fisherman uh, in Capernaum on the, the Sea of Galilee. And he fishes with his brother Andrew and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the, the future disciples of Jesus. And his brother Andrew is a, is a follower of John the Baptist. He, he finds out about Jesus. He realizes that the Messiah has finally arrived. He goes and tells Peter that the Messiah is here. He's coming. And then shortly after this, what we see is Peter has his own encounter with Jesus. Jesus shows up on the shore while Peter is out in his boat fishing. And Jesus calls to him to come follow, come follow me. And Peter responds in this amazing step of faith. He leaves behind his nets. He leaves behind the boats, his livelihood, everything he's worked out in his life so far to go follow Jesus. And he goes on this amazing journey with them. Here's Peter. And as Peter goes along in this journey, we see a lot about him. We see the character of him. We see how he's kind of this really boisterous, uh, brash guy who often is the, the, the spokesman for the disciples. And what we often see too is that he, is, he puts his foot in his mouth. He's more bark than bite. He's got real problems. Many times in the Bible, we see this, this inaction. There's, he's the guy who... While he's talking with Jesus, Jesus tells him, prophesies that he's going to die in fulfilling his mission. And Peter says, no, Jesus, I'm not going to let that happen. And Jesus famously says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He's a guy who, uh, while talking to Jesus, tells him, I'm never going to abandon you. I'm never going to deny you. I will follow you to the death. And then a short time later, he's the guy who goes with Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane. And while Jesus is, is wrestling and struggling in his moment, uh, talking to the Father in prayer, begging for another way to go forward with his mission, we find Peter asleep multiple times. He fails Jesus as a friend in that moment. And then shortly after that, as Jesus is arrested, he panics and he chops off the ears of one of the servants who Jesus ends up healing. And Jesus, he goes to face trial. And we find Peter in the background denying Jesus three times, including once to a little girl. Peter's journey is marked by failure. And, 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 and he, he feels that. But what we also see in that is Jesus loving and restoring him. And Peter goes on to do amazing things, but he still, he still struggles along the way. He goes on after the death of Jesus and Jesus coming and going again. He goes on where he stands up and says that we have to fulfill prophecy and replace Judas he stands up and, and takes the gospel. He's actually the first one to ever take the gospel to the Gentiles. And even along there, he's still messing up. He's still, he still lives a rocky life. He causes issues and eventually becomes the guy who takes the, the gospel to the Jews. But ultimately what we see is a man who's willing to give his everything for Jesus and for the gospel. He goes to jail and he ultimately dies Proclaiming Jesus. 
According to the tradition, Peter dies on a cross upside down. He is martyred for his beliefs. And so we want to keep in mind this journey that we see out of Peter as we read through his letter because he can be really wordy, he can be really in your face, and yet he's not speaking as someone sitting on a throne telling people, get it together, do all these things. He's actually a guy who's saying, I've lived this life. I've, I've journeyed with Jesus. I have failed every step along the way, and yet I'm trying to live out my calling despite the circumstances of my life. And he's inviting the recipients of the letter. He's really inviting us to do the same. And so today, we're going to be diving into the first 12 verses of 1 Peter. And I want to, I want to just be kind of transparent and honest. I really struggle with the openings to uh, the letters. Most of my life, I have come to them. I start out a letter, and I just like blast through it. I'm like, this is boring. I want the good stuff. Because it's a letter in how we have uh, formats for the beginning of our letters. You know, dear so-and-so, or to whom it may concern, I hope this letter finds you well. Peter had a format in which he was writing letters. They had their own style. And, and so this beginning seems like that, to whom it may concern, and also kind of like the beginning of a, that five-paragraph essay you had to write in high school where it's like, tell them what you're going to tell them. I'm like, I don't, I'm not interested in that. Like, give me the good stuff. Give me the meat and potatoes, which I don't like potatoes, so I don't know why I would use that phrase. But, right, I want, I want the substance. But if we skip over this beginning, we miss a lot. It's God's word, and it really sets the context for what Peter is going to write for these next five chapters. He reveals so much in it. And what we're going to see in this, in this opening, and what we're going to see throughout the whole book is this. He is writing to an exiled people called to obedience through a living hope. And these words that I pulled out, they're actually pulled out from the scripture, pulled out from his opening. And we're going to see this run throughout his letter. An exiled people called to obedience through a living hope. So let's just go ahead. We're going to read through the first 12 verses. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been given, grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of, Jesus, excuse me, Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Peter is just like this really incredibly wordy guy. And the truth is, as we go through this book, we're going to spend 14 weeks through five chapters. It's a fairly short letter. And what we could really do is we could spend months and months, years diving through every last thing Peter has to say. We could pull apart word, every, every last word. And there would be value in that. But what we want to do is make sure uh, that we're pulling out the really important and applicable things that the word of God is both living and active. 
And so we're going to take and look at the things that are directly applicable to who we are right now. And so the first thing we're going to see in this letter is an exiled people. He starts off and he tells us who this is written to. And it's really important that we understand this because it's going to set the framework for everything else he's going to write about. He talks about that he's writing to the elect exiles of the Spurgeon in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And these are five Roman provinces in what is now modern-day northern Turkey. And if you're like me and like in high school, when, uh, when geography was brought up, your eyes just glazed over and you're like, that, make, that doesn't mean anything to me. It's like that area of the Middle East the northwestern part that's like, you're not really sure if it's Europe or Asia or Africa. That's where this is. It's a massive landmass. And so unlike the other letters in the New Testament, he's not writing to a specific church, specific local church, or a specific person. He's writing to the church at large across this huge space, writing to a bunch of Christians who, have, are, who consider themselves exiles. It says, the elect exiles of the dispersion. So this word elect, it just simply means chosen. Um, But he's writing to these exiles of the dispersion. And this really gives us an exact time, uh, date, and and people who he's writing to. Unlike some of the other letters where we just have to kind of guess from the context, we know exactly who he's writing to. He's writing to Christians who are scattered across the area uh, during about 60, right after 64 BC. And this is a time in Rome that is famous for this man right here, Nero. He's the emperor. This is the height of his rule. And Nero's uh, decisions, Nero's choices have caused persecution and has caused the church to scatter. And To be clear, Nero has done terrible things. He's a terrible man. To give a little background on him, Nero, he doesn't actually start out as heir to the throne. He's not supposed to be emperor. He's born to a disgraced general and a woman named Agrippina the Younger, who is the daughter uh, of Caligula. And Agrippina desires both for her son and for herself to have just a massive amount of power. But she can't do it by herself. She's a woman, so she uses her son. She manipulates him and all those around him so that she can consolidate power. After the death of her husband, she uh, goes and the emperor at the time, Claudius, she goes to Claudius, she disgraces her, his wife, has her banished from the area, and then she marries Claudius, her uncle. She has now combined the families. Nero is now part of the royal family, but he's not heir to the throne yet. He has a a, a stepbrother, Claudius' actual son. And while this is all happening, Agrippina is trying to, to work her way to get Nero into power. And she does this through assassination. She poisons Claudius. She teaches Nero how to be an assassin, how to use poison. And he poisons his stepbrother so that he can now be the heir to the throne. He steps in as the emperor and ultimately later down the line has Agrippina, his own mother, killed because she comes in conflict with him. He's just, he's an assassin raised by an assassin. And what's interesting is this was probably the most tame part of his life. After this, Nero is known for really all the sins of Rome. If you roll them into one man, that would be Nero. He's known for his sexual perversions, his, his, his sadism, his, his desire for blood. He is an evil, evil man. And so right before this letter is written, we find Nero. And he's wanting to build what is known as his Domus Array. It's his golden palace. It's this, this extravagant, opulent house that he wants to live in. But there's a problem. The place that he wants to put it in, the nicest area of Rome, it's already taken. It's taken by temples and shrines and houses to the heroes of Rome. It's taken by the politicians and the rich. And so Nero can talk to plan. He's going to burn this area down so he can have it. And so he sends out arsonists throughout Rome, in particular this area, and they light fire to Rome. A massive portion of Rome burns to the ground. 
And Nero now has turned the people against him. They don't know for sure, but all that they've seen from him, they point the finger at Nero and say, it's this guy, he did this to us. He burnt down our homes. And so Nero, he, he's a master of manipulation. He's a master of flattery. He goes and starts raiding the coffers of Rome to buy people new houses, but that's not enough. They're still looking at him as the bad guy. And he says, it's not me who did this. It's the Christians. It's them. They're the ones. They hate you, and they lit your city on fire. And the people buy it, and they turn against the Christians. They chase them from their homes. They, they, they chase them out of Rome into, the, into hiding, and they actually persecute them in the sense of real persecution. They put them to death. What we see in recorded history is, and it's brutal, Nero is recorded as having taken captured Christians. He would wrap them up in animal skins and then put them out to his attack dogs and they would kill him. And he would make a spectacle of this. The church has dispersed. They are exiles and they are living in fear. And it's here that we find Peter writing to them. He's writing to people who are experiencing real persecution, who are really exiles for their faith. And he's writing to them in the same situation. Later in the book, it says he's in exile in Babylon, keyword for Rome. He's hiding himself. He's not telling them just go out and die, but he is saying to them as he writes this, we are called to something. And we're going to get to it more, but he says, we're called to obedience. Despite our persecution, we are called to obedience. What Satan is using to silence the church, we are not going to be silenced. Despite the fact that we're exiles. And so as we're going through this book, it really heightens the sense of this call to obedience. It heightens the sense of everything Peter's writing about that you're, they are experiencing real persecution. And despite all that, you are called to live a certain way. And I'm just, it's really hard though, because as we're reading this, you and I, we're not experiencing persecution. It's hard to relate to this letter in that sense. The worst persecution I've ever experienced, I wouldn't even call persecution, is I've lost, I, lost people who don't want to talk to me because I'm a believer. That's the extent of my persecution, which is to say I don't have any. And in America, persecution exists in the most rarest of events. But we can relate to this, is in, this in this idea of being in exile. That we're not actually forced from our homes, but what I hear increasingly is that we feel like exiles in our own country that we live in a country that looks down upon us. And this is why Nero was so easily able to put the fires on the Christians. They looked at them with suspicion. They looked at them as crazy people, that they were hypocrites, that they were, might even be cannibals because they partake in communion, that they were uh, wild because they believed in one God and one truth. And for a lot of us, that's a similar society that we find ourselves in now that we are looked at with increasing hostility. We are looked at as suspicious. We are looked at as bigots, are, are uh, phobic, uncaring, uncompassionate, uh, crazy people for having the, uh, the audacity to believe in a single truth. I grew up, and many of you grew up, particularly those of us in millennials or older, we grew up in a country that Christianity was kind of the norm. We may not have been around followers of Christ but Christianity was kind of the base of everything. The morals, the principles, the decisions, the, everything that guided us as a country had kind of this rooted in the Bible. We may, have, we, we may not have had God, but we were guided by his principles. But today we find ourselves just a short 30 years later, it's no longer the case. And we're feeling like we don't belong here. We're not wanted here. And so as we go through this book, we keep that in mind, what he's calling us to, if he can call up people who are persecuted, who are losing their lives to obedience, we can certainly be called to that obedience as well. And see, so he goes on, and he, this is what's going to be written about much of in this book, is this call to obedience, an exiled people called to obedience, right there in verse 2, for obedience 
to Jesus Christ. Something he's going to talk about for the next five chapters. And, and the truth is, obedience is often a really difficult word to talk about. It's one of the things that we often don't like to discuss in church. And I'm talking about the church at large. Obedience has been pushed to the side. We went from this like uh, fire and brimstone to now the, the, the overabundance of grace. And we don't, we don't, we often don't want to talk about obedience because obedience doesn't put people in the seats. Kind of going back to our DNA series that we just finished up talking about forgiveness and grace. And these are all great things and true. And they're a massive part of the gospel. But the obedience is something we want to skip over often. But to be clear, we were called to obedience. We were called not just to believe, not just to be given, be forgiven, but we were called to follow. We were called to sin no more. That was the call of Jesus in our life. That was the call that Peter had for them what you're going through, you are to remain obedient. And it's really hard because this word often gets twisted. When we use the word obedience, for many of us, what it means is we're not supposed to do the things that we're told not to do, right? We're not supposed to do the fun things, or at least the fun things according to the world. And yet obedience encapsulates so much more. Yes, there is truth in that. We are called to put aside our fleshly desires. But obedience is about all the things in my life. It's not just the hands, not just the actions. It's the mind and the heart. It's a complete transformation. It's changing our minds and aligning it with God. It's what Jesus talked about. It's not just about not murdering someone. It's about not hating someone. It's not just about not committing adultery. It's, the, it's about also not lusting after someone. It's about submitting to the will of God in our life, building his kingdom versus building my own kingdom. When we talk about the spiritual pathway, it's getting to that last step along it, that, that steward, moving from servant to steward. I'm not building what I want. I'm building what God desires. Obedience is about an entire life focused on Christ. And that's what Jesus is calling us to. That's what Peter is calling these people to, to obedience. And to be clear, it's not just obedience for obedience sake. I think that's another reason we have to struggle with obedience, this idea of obedience, because I'm like, why? So I can simply be obedient, right? Just go back to being a parent. Or being a kid with your, par with your parents, they tell you, don't do something. Why? Because I said not to. Right? We immediately, in our sinful nature, we re we're repulsed by that. We repel it. We don't want that. We don't want to be obedient for obedience sake. And yet, Peter, that's not what he's calling them to. What he's calling them to is mission. You're obedient for the mission that what you do in spite of persecution reveals something about you. It reveals who has transformed you, who your Savior is. It reveals Jesus Christ. And he uses this interesting phrasing, sprinkled with his blood. He goes back to this Old Testament idea, this old, this old covenant. And it goes back to Mount, uh, the Israelites at Mount Sinai with Moses in which God is establishing his covenant with his people and they're sprinkled with, with blood. And this old covenant, right? It's about God. It's, to be clear, it's a conditional covenant. God has chosen these people. He's going to make them his chosen people. He's going to provide them protection and blessing in a harsh world. They'll be able to withstand famine. They'll withstand the warring factions and nations of the reason, region. And in return, they will obey him. They will keep his commandments. They will be his people. And in that situation, what would happen is as he would do this, as he would provide his protection, what would happen is that he would reveal himself to the nations through this. The lost, the, the lost people would come to know him because of what he would do to that people. And their obedience was focused on what they would get from God. And yet what's happening is there's a new covenant. With Jesus is death and resurrection. There's a new covenant. And this covenant is unconditional. And in it, Jesus dies for us. He takes our sin. He, we are granted forgiveness and eternal life but it's no longer about what we're going to do. 
We're not, we don't have to be obedient to receive this. He does it fully of his own will. He does it for us. There's nothing we do to earn it. And so what he's saying is this obedience that you're exhibiting, this, this transformation that you're allowing to take place, it's not so you can get something from God. It's now obedience uh, out of what God has done. That the work of Jesus Christ is to lead us to obedience. The new covenant is to overflow the, the Holy Spirit in us, is to, is to overflow all of this in us. So that's what is our natural reaction is obedience. And so he goes on to end this, this opening and he goes through quite a lot. He's very wordy again. He goes to this, this obedience is through a living hope. It's not because of what you're going to get. It's because of what has been done for you. And if you remain focused on that, we can live an obedient life. Because the reality is we don't want to be obedient. And not only that, to be truthful, we can't fully be obedient. All of human history has revealed that. We're not obedient people. We struggle greatly with being obedient even day to day. We can't just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. So Peter kind of gives this, this outline of this is what we're going to focus on to be an obedient people. We are going to focus on a living hope. He talks about he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. It's right there. That in our rebirth, when we give our lives to Christ, we are spiritually reborn. We are transformed with him. Our focus is no longer on what's right in front of us. Our focus is on what he has done and what he has promised us. He goes on to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. He talks about our future promise. He talks about our security. He's writing to a people, remember, who are dying for what they believe. And he says, despite the circumstances of today, the promise of tomorrow remains and is true. God is faithful. He will be faithful. The eternity that you have with him, that persecution, persecution can't touch. Persecution is trying to take everything away. And it can take away everything that is material in this world. But for the rest of eternity, you are promised eternal life. You are promised a life with Christ and all that he, and all that he has to give us. And through all of this, what he's been going over is is the gospel. He's talking about the three acts of the gospel. You have been saved from the penalty of sin. You are being saved from the power of sin and you will be saved from the presence of sin. God is working through all of this. He has been working and through the persecution or even where we feel as exiles, he's continuing the work and to keep our eyes focused on what he has for us now and in the future, despite whatever circumstances we have that God is working. And he goes on to talk about how, how it's not just through your own power, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, you're not going to become obedient people simply because you desire to be obedient, but it's okay because the Spirit is alive and living inside you as a follower of Christ. He's going to give you the will in the way to become obedient children of God. He finishes up, he talks about, the, he starts referencing the prophets, the prophets of the Old Testament. And he said that spirit, the spirit that empowered them, that inspired them to write to, to, the, to the Israelites, those prophets that inspired a people to, during their persecution, their exiles, <clears throat> That same spirit that has inspired people to now is still working through uh, the people Peter is writing to and he's working through us right now. And that he is inspiring through what they're going through. He's inspiring those people for us today and we are inspiring people for this future. The spirit is working and alive. That same spirit that has always been inspiring is doing so now. And we can find our hope in that. When he, so as we head through the rest of this book, the rest of this letter, what he has called us, he said to us is we are an exiled people called to obedience through a living hope. And so I ask, I hope today was 
helpful to kind of set up where we're going to be going for the next 13 weeks. I hope it's something that we can keep in mind that sets up all that he's going to be talking to in a reminder that though he can be very in your face, though he can call us to something uh, that can often be misconstrued as legalism, he's not doing it in such a way. He's, he's saying, I have done this through the power of the Spirit and, and I have walked this rocky journey, so walk it alongside me. I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you uh, for all your prayers over the last several months as uh, Green has been searching for a new home. Uh, we're so grateful for the provision of God and that he has provided for us. So thank you guys. I love you. Have a great day. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, today we have a couple questions for our transformational moment uh, that we want to ask you to wrestle with coming out of uh, Peter's opening to his letter. The first is, what is driving your obedience? That is, what is your motivation for obedience? As he's going to be calling uh, us really to obedience, we have to wrestle with why would we even want to be obedient? Are we being obedient simply so that we escape uh, maybe the wrath of God or the judgment of God or to get something from him? Are we being obedient out of what he has already done for us and out of the the Holy Spirit that lives within us. It's important that we have a proper understanding of our motivation for obedience as we move forward and allow God to be working through his words. And the second question is, what in your life is inhibiting your hope? That for us to be an obedient children of God, we have to remain focused on the hope that we have, the hope that we have for our future with him, the hope of how he's working through us, but oftentimes there are things in our life, uh, maybe for a moment, or that come and go, that really uh, inhibit our hope. That Satan, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And what he often wants to steal is your hope to take your focus off what God has promised you and how God is working and focus on the situation in front of you. So what is inhibiting your hope? Appreciate you guys. Have a great day.